Okay, so um, so I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of the work Europe's Lost Frontiers has done on the west coast of Britain. And it's fair to say that this presentation might be a bit different to what you've seen so far today, as we just don't have the data that we have for Doggerland for, for many reasons. And so this presentation is more about potential. And if we can get further funding, we can apply what we're learning in the North Sea to these areas of the west coast of Britain. And so the focus of this study was the near offshore areas of North and West Wales. So the, the green box here is the Irish Sea study area and the, the red box here is the Cardigan Bay study area. And the project targeted these areas in 2018 using the RV Celtic uh, Voyager that was supplied by the Marine Institute Island. And as Vince mentioned this morning, not all went to plan. The weather especially meant that we didn't capture the seismic and borehole data we wanted. However, on the positive side, we did um, managed to acquire 30 high resolution Pinga survey lines um, and they imaged below the seabed to about 50 meters. And my co-authors at St Andrews, um, Richard Bates and Sarah Boyd have performed um, topographic modeling too using bathymetry. So we've got something to talk about today um, and Cardigan Bay, so this area in the red box will be our focus for the rest of the presentation. So why Cardigan Bay? Uh, well, Wales has a wonderful oral historical tradition, and within such stories such as Quantra Gwaelod, a rich fertile land um, was lost to the sea, and that's that's what it says in the story. And what we think maybe is, did these stories retain a memory of a landscape that disappeared over a few generations, thousands of years ago? And also, with the exception of the submerged forest at Borth and a few other locations, we know relatively little about the Mesolithic landscape in this area. The coastline adjacent to Cardigan Bay has sparse evidence for pre-Neolithic human activity. Could this be evidence buried offshore or is there some other reason? We'll come back to that at the end of the presentation. And finally, similar submerged coastal landscapes in Denmark have yielded over 2,000 sites. So further in investigations of our coastlines are overdue. And bringing it back to the Lost Frontiers objectives, uh, the red areas of this map at the bottom from the Aquaterra paper um, show the areas that were potentially habitable um, where there was terrestrial land um, exposed during the last sea level low stand about 27,000 years ago, when sea level was 125 metres below present, present. And the majority of this land has not been surveyed from an archaeological perspective, from a geological perspective maybe, but not from an archaeological perspective. And this low sea level meant that large tracts of land now submerged um, like areas like Cardigan Bay, would have been terrestrial land and habitable once the glaciers had retreated, but before flooding had occurred. And thus we have an incomplete archaeological record of the late Upper Paleolithic, Mesolithic and the transition into the Neolithic for, for, for Northwest Europe. And this also affects the current archaeological record in the existing finds may not be in their proper context if we don't understand where the coastlines, migration routes and population centres were. Bringing it back to Cardigan Bay, um, what I'll do now is uh, go through a little bit of background, geological background of the area. So we're looking at this red box here and the map I'm showing is bathymetry. Um, and the lighter um, areas that are sort of hugging the coastline, these are areas where the seabed is shallower um, relative to present day sea level and the blues are where it's deeper. So our area of interest, the seabed is 15 to 30 metres below present day sea level. And our seismic data is located 15, um, 5 to 10 uh, kilometres from the present coastline. And these protrusions here, um, they're sort of hidden by the red box a little bit, that come out from the coast, they're called sands, and they are glacial moraines associated with the Welsh ice, ice sheet. And this slide just illustrates the underlying geology of the area. So the upper image shows the lithology and the lower image shows the age of the rocks. So in the survey area, um, this area is over underlain by um, lower Paleozoic shales, whilst there are more sort of varied Mesozoic rocks as we go north and west. Basically, the underlying geology is really, really old. And overlying this, there is both Irish and Welsh till encountered in uh, BGS boreholes, as the survey area was the confluence uh, between two of the two ice sheets, the Welsh and the Irish um, ice sheet. And that is illustrated on the top image by the dashed line up there. And a closer look at a transect through um, some of the BGS boreholes. Uh, show that we have earlier interglacial uh, sediments and till sequences out towards St George's Channel. And as we come closer to the coast, we have these post last glacial maximum um, sediments. Um, and from, for the ELF project, our main focus is the Mesolithic. And thus we are focusing on the post till sediments. 
and the boreholes of 7342 and ZZ27 uh, penetrate those sections. They were described in um, Haynes et al. 1977 as having terrestrial deposits overlain by increasingly marine influenced sediments. And there's one carbon-14 date in, in the peat layer from um, ZZ27, and then um, the date that comes out is 8740 uh, BP, calibrated to around 9.5 to 10,000 um, years BP. And modelling work carried out by Sarah Boyd and Richard Bates at St Andrews for this project has helped redefine our understanding of the terrestrial landscape and how long lived it was. So the paleotopography was modelled for Cardigan Bay for six time intervals between 11,000 uh, years and 6,000 years BP. Interpolated prediction services of relative sea level were created using existing sea level index point databases and bathymetry, and also paleo river networks were modelled. And in these images, the blue is the marine realm, um, and also um, we've got rivers on there as well, and the light browns are the low-lying area that was exposed at the, the subsequent times, and the greens show uh, present-day configurations. And this modelling suggests that sea level in the study area is roughly 20, uh, minus 20 metres at around 10,000 years before present, and that between 9,000 years and, sorry, between 11,000 years and 9,000 years before present, we lose an area roughly 3,000 square kilometres to the sea. And to, to put that in context, Wales is, is 20,000 kilometres, um, sorry, 20,000 square kilometres. Um, so it's quite a large area. Um, and that the present um, day geometry of the coastline was established between 7.5 and 6,000 years BP. We all, what we also see is that the present river systems, the Glass Lynn, the Madoch Dovey, let me make sure I'm pointing the right ones, the Madoch Dovey, the Rydal and the Estuaries, extended across this terrestrial landscape in a northeast southwest trend. Um, and, that, and we also know that the now submerged offshore reaches of those, um, those systems have much shallower gradients than the onshore counterparts. And it's also worth noting from this that the coastline around the Tavy, this is the River Tavy here, has been stable for much longer than those of the rivers to the north. So focusing in on the geophysical data set we have, um, the Pinga survey um, from 2018 focused in on a deep within the bathymetry um, known as trawling ground, so that's here between the rivers Dubby and the Tavy, or between um, Aberystwyth and Cardigan. And from the, from the modelling and from a couple of pinger lines that, that, um, that had already been taken in the 1960s, we know that underneath this, um, this relative deep um, are the submerged reaches of the Rydal Ustrid river system. The survey data here is shown in black. And uh, the survey data was, is decimeter scale resolution. And like I've said previously, we could image down to about 50 meters. Uh, calls from this area um, were not se successfully obtained, but we have used those um, boreholes um, described and analyzed in Haynes et al. 19, um, 1977. So the Z3, um, the 7342 and the ZZ27 calls. And what we see from this seismic data is a buried valley system with highly variable geomorphology. And in the seismic lines that are showing here, um, the purple lines at the top of the seabed, the present seabed, and the red lines are the base of the infill of this feature, of this buried valley feature. The main valley deepens towards the southwest from seven, um, seven meters depth to 20 meters depth, narrowing to a kilometer's width. And previous interpretations have interpreted it as a buried meltwater channel. And just briefly, why are these features potentially good for offshore archaeology? In simplest terms, they provide accommodation for sedimentary layers, as we can sort of just about see in this image, these sedimentary layers to build up as sea level rises. And we'll come back to that at the end. And so we will take a closer look at the acoustic character of one of these lines. So this is a northwest southeast cross section across the valley, and the vertical scale is, vertical scale is in two-way time um, milliseconds. So it's not completely equivalent to depth, but we can get a good idea of what it looks like down there um, below the seabed. So uh, below the red horizon, we have chaotic, um, irregular acoustic character to the east, and more clearly bedded reflections to the west. Above the red, um, the red horizon, we have um, two main acoustic fascias. A weak transparent fill, which I'm going to point to now, so just at the base of here and, and, and on this side as well, and, and these reflections are, are dipping. 
And on top of that, we have sub-horizontal sub laminates um, that have a stronger acoustic um, character. And they onlap onto these earlier um, layers, sort of infilling the, the area. And all of that is truncated by this green reflection I've pointed out here um, at the top. And that's a few meters below the seabed. Um, and that sort of truncates everything underneath. We do have some, what I should say is that we do have some issues with shallow gas in the area, which affects our ability to complete the image, everything, the stratigraphy and the structure of the area. And so there is a potential that we're not seeing the whole story in our data set, and this needs more work. And so when we map out the base of the valley feature, we get a depth structure map, looks like this. And so on the, the left is a 3D representation of area A, which is where we have the highest density of data. And on the left is our 2D map of, of the original or the sort of raw in, interpretation that we've done in, in Kingdom Suite. And just to mention, yeah, this area has good data coverage. And as we go south, we the coverage is limited and the data quality also was reduced because of because of weather, I think it was. Um, so with additional seismic, things could change in terms of our interpretation. So in each of the images, the lighter oranges and the reds are where the surface is shallowest, so closest to the, to the present sea, um, sea surface. And um, the greens and the, the blues are where we've got deeper sections. And the main features, again, are that we're narrowing and deepening um, towards the south um, in the main channel. And we have a shallow area um, to the north of the valley. And we're also able to, um, to image where the Aeron drained into the, um, into the valley system. We also have um, an area that's, that's very shallow within the north of the valley. Um, again, this, th there may be issues with, with shallow gas in here, so we, we do need to do more work on this. The two uh, boreholes that we've used in this study, said said uh, 27 is just missed by our survey, but we do intersect um, 7342, which penetrates a valley feature, which we think is the same one as imaged up in, in area A, but the seismic routine is a bit sketchy, so we really need some more data to completely confirm this, but it's likely that their seismic character is very similar. And we use the existing boreholes to give some paleoenvironmental meaning to all those wiggly lines I've just shown you in the seismic sections. So, um, so ZZ27 setting, we're pretty sure it's on the flank of a valley or on a relative topographic height at the flank of the valley. Um, it's a short core that encountered Welsh till at the base and it's overlain by a peat associated with salt marsh conditions and that was the one that was dated to around 9.5 thousand years ago um, calibrated. And uh, this in itself is overlain by laminated clays and silts that have, um, have come back as being associated with brackish conditions and becoming increasingly marine as we go up the core with fully marine conditions at the top. And we think these major changes um, within the cores are reflected within the seismic data. Um, so that the red and the green horizons are essentially where, where we're getting big changes in um, seismic character, but also where we're getting the, the major changes, the major unconformities within the core. Um, and borehole 7342 is a bit different. It's within the valley system itself. So this is an example of where um, the sort of location it's, it's in. It's in the, the channel axis. And it penetrates all the way down to lower Paleozoic bedrock at 60, uh, 60 meters, which we, we don't image here. It's below our, our, our seismic section. And it represents a 30 meter sequence of uh, Quaternary and Holocene sediments. Above the Irish Sea, above the Irish Sea till um, at 51.5 meters is a one meter thick unit of well bedded uh, shaley, um, sorry, not shaley, shelly gravelly sands. Um, and they're, they are seen um, outside the area of the borehole in the seismic data to, to thicken quite substantially away from the borehole. And forearm analysis of this section um, by Haynes et al. 1977 interpreted them as channel sands as a, uh, and, a main, and within the setting of a main channel estuary with also cold water species. So um, Haynes et al. suggested an, a date of about 11 to 12,000 years before present, but we don't have any dates. That was based on correlation to onshore records. Um, but the most important thing here is that by the late glacial, um, the area is already under marine influence, which is backed up by the modelling that St. Andrew, Andrew's team have, have done. And so to apply that information to our seismic sections, what we're looking at here is um, within the, the main valley at location is horizontally bedded till, Irish sea till likely at this, in this area anyway, overlain by late glacial uh, channel sands and muds, 
already marine influenced um, and separated those themselves are separated from the till by this strong amplitude continuous reflection that's, that's shown in red and above that we've got um, an estrine infill um, of um, onlapping onto the flu these these channel sands that are likely fluvial and tidal and on the flanks of the uh, of the valley we have salt marshes peat formation and wetlands and the green horizon is erosional and it delineates a change in environmental regime um, and a switch to fully marine conditions so what have we learned about the paleo environment and the paleo geography from from what we've done so far until about eight thousand years uh, before present the Rydal Estriv and Aeron were tributaries of this long uh, river corridor that's um, adjacent to the coastline offshore and is imaged within our seismic data set. And we've been able to map out areas also that are areas of high relative topography versus areas of low top, um, relative topography. So that's what we're seeing in, in, in this map here. So the, the darker greens are areas that, um, that are relatively high and would have been emergent for longer um, during the, the, uh, the flooding of the area. And um, also something that's of interest, linking it back to what's going on in the onshore, is that uh, brackish conditions at, at the Dovey at Borth, which is in, in this location roughly, uh, at around 11,000 years before present, the, when, the, when the coastline, so basically we've got brackish conditions at, at Borth in, in the River Dovey 11,000 years ago, when the coastline was 20 kilometres uh, to, the, to the west of this position. And that means that we've got these long, narrow uh, tidal estuaries extending some considerable distance up catchment from the um, open coastline. And the seaward part of these systems would have flooded during the late glacial, as attested by the cold climate fauna in Borehole 7342. And so bring it back to archaeology, um, some quick points on the archaeological potential from this initial work. Um, the, first of all, the environment of this coastal plain that's now submerged in Cardigan Bay would have been highly productive, um, a highly productive riverine and estuarine zone offering a highly suitable environment for supporting hunting and gathering communities. Um, and here we've got um, a block model or a block diagram showing the key features interpreted for, um, of the, in the offshore landscape, the main valley, its tidal channel, um, flanked by salt marshes and low and these low forested interflues, which would have been on the higher the higher topography, and um, and we can sort of link that back to what we're seeing in the seismic data and our our three D um, structural map of the base of, of our valley. It will be these these areas is what we're talking about when we talk about low forested interflues, and we've got the 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 valley itself um, here, and. Um, how this relates to preservation potential for archaeological material? Well, Martin Bates mentioned earlier in his talk that there's a lot still unknown, and in five years' time, we might be able to say a lot more about this. However, the long and short of it is that within the valley itself, we have a greater likelihood of preservation because there's greater subsidence and burial within the valley itself. While these, these, higher, these areas of higher topography, though they were emergent for longer, are much more likely to have been subject to erosion from the subsequent marine transgression. And this area we've got to the north, where we have this narrowing and shallowing of the valley, could be important archaeologically. Elsewhere, this type of area has provided resources um, and meeting places for Mesolithic humans. So all this will go into future planning of where to, to collect more data, whether to do more surveys on seismic. All of this information will be taken into account. And to draw the presentation to a close, these images are from the forthcoming book chapter led by Martin Bates. And I massively oversimplify this, so I'm really sorry, Martin. Um, so here we're showing um, the model coastal geomorphologies as we've seen in, in uh, previous slides from 10kABP and 8kABP with the early Mesolithic sites plotted on them as green circles. So these are the early Mesolithic sites of West Wales in each one. And just to say that these triangles are not sites, they're forests. What we see is there's a sort of relative lack of Mesolithic sites within the embayed shore of Cardigan Bay compared to the north and the south. So what could be the reason for this relative paucity of sites? Is it just that the Cardigan Bay plain was just a more attractive place to hang out than West Wales at the time? Our answer is sort of hope, we hope so, and we want to go and find out. But also there could be other um, things going on. So it could be cultural and historical differences within the area on shore compared to the, uh, to the north and south. So we're talking about land use, um, development of the coast, 
the, the culture of collectors and interested tourists and, and academics in, in these other areas in Pembrokeshire, for instance, and and um, and in um, sorry, and in um, North Wales. And if this is the case, well, that's great also because there's even more potential on the, in the onshore section as well between the uh, the Dovey and and the Tavy. Either way, we can now start looking at those existing sites on shore with this new data in mind, uh, and we can start contextualising existing sites. So in conclusion, modelling and geological data show that there was, there was a terrestrial and habitable land in the Cardigan Bay in the late Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic, but it was largely flooded by 8,000 years before president, present. Sorry. All of the shallow boreholes and seismic data previously, like shown here, um, previously from the BGS uh, database were, were gathered in the 60s and 70s, or most of it at least. So this was the first attempt in this area for two generations to, to collect data. And I think we have a, a massive opportunity to learn from the work we're doing in the North Sea, um, both in Southern River and in Brown Bank, and apply it to this area. And what we need is a coring sampling campaign and additional seismic to start to understand the paleo environment and geoarchaeology of this area, and thus the late Upper paleo, paleo, I can't say that, Paleolithic and Mesolithic of the west coast of Britain. And to do this, we need more funding to go and find out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Some uh, again, some fantastic coming in under time, which is great. So um, that gives us a little bit of time for for questions. Um, uh, ben, should I stop sharing, or what's uh, the deal? Uh, uh, yeah, they'd say it's up, it's up to you, I guess. I mean, maybe leave it for now in case there's anything you need to come back to in, in the okay. questions. I suppose. Uh, let me just see here. So we got a question from uh, Mike F. Statthew. Sorry, Mike, if I've mangled mangled your surname <laughs> there. Mike asks, uh, 8,000 years ago, would the top of the forest trees on Cardigan Bay still be above sea level? 8,000 years. I'm not certain. Maybe maybe Martin, I don't know if Martin's here. Because Martin's more, more up to date than Martin and Richard with what's going on in the onshore section. Yeah, you might, you might, you might cut Bully on the hop there. I, I, I. I assume he's in the room so well, well maybe while he's kind of um, um thinking about that so like if you um uh, just to answer that one uh the models suggest that the near shore so around the places we're finding both or the both is much younger or much later but the, the 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 there is a strip along the shore just still visible at that uh, at that time period but very quickly after that the models would suggest we lose it yeah, so you see, can you still see my screen? Because actually it's on my screen as we speak. So the 8, the 8,000 um, model is there and you can see there's a little bit of a strip of, of land just where just where both is, basically. Okay, um, next question from Bjorn Nilsson um, from Lund. Um, thanks, Rachel. Um, do you have any evidence of exposed uh, moorlog, tree stumps and trawls or other histor historic ethnographic? evidence of terrestrial landscape archaeological findings thank you so um offshore there hasn't there's not the same level of um trawled finds that that we see in the north sea i know i've, I've spoke to richard and martin about this a long time ago but that you don't get the same amount of um things coming up in the fishing nets and, and, and in the in the trawl nets as far as i know but again richard will, might say different no, that's, that's, that's correct. I mean, the, the, you do get some up in Liverpool Bay that have come up and uh, aren't very well recorded. Um, but, but other than that, uh, it's near short stuff again in the, uh, um, th th that was discovered, I think, and reported by Aberystwyth University a number of years ago, but not from, from off in the trawling ground. Okay. Um, another question from Steen Hildebrandt. Uh, could you clarify whether the channel was formed subglacially or after ice retreat? Again, we haven't done, I guess we haven't got to that position yet. We've, we're looking at data. The data was relatively recently reprocessed, so I'll be looking at that in the next few months. So we might be able to say more about it in the future. Okay. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> uh, Okay, any more questions? We're we're actually we're um, we're well, well well in time, which is great. Um, so just give people a couple of minutes there to maybe collect their thoughts and see if anyone else has got any other comments there. 
and um, it's great to see this kind of work done for for, um, for Ireland, for example. You know where we where we've lost a lot of um, coastal plain. I think you know, and again, in questions of the Mesolithic in particular. Um, I don't know if some grey grey Warrens in the room somewhere. You know, these questions of where where our Mesolithic is in Ireland, in places like Fogarty's Cove on the on the current coast. You know, so um, that's that's another project. I think James James Bonsall's also had his eye on that one as well. 